The Old Testament reading is from Lamentations chapter 3, beginning at verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. Glory Glory to you, you, O Lord. Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well. And live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garment, I will be made well. Immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who had 
said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. For she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What would you do for your children? It's not a great question, is it? What would the better question be? What wouldn't you do for your children? Some of you have children at home now. Some of you have children who are grown and out of the house. Some of you may not have children of your own per se, but there are children in your lives that you've taken care of as your own. You've cared for them like sons and daughters. So what wouldn't you do for them? The answer is probably nothing. Nothing. There is nothing that you wouldn't do for them. Mothers give of their very selves to bring children into this world. Fathers would willingly die to protect their children. And that's not to even mention all the other less dramatic stuff. The homework help around the kitchen table, the piano lessons and baseball camps and hockey tournaments out of town. What about when your children suffer? What wouldn't you do to help them in their suffering? Is there anything harder than seeing your child suffer? Anything more gut-wrenching and painful, especially when you don't know what to do and can't help them, or you're doing everything you can and it seems like nothing is working. Got a bit of a show out there this morning, don't we? I'm not sure what's going on. In our gospel reading today from Mark chapter 5, we see two profound stories of suffering and healing. The first is about a ruler of the synagogue named Jairus, who pleads with Jesus to help his suffering 12-year-old daughter. As a ruler of the synagogue, Jairus was a man of means and status. He was part of a group of elders who managed the services and other affairs of the synagogue. He was responsible for arranging visiting rabbis, managing the synagogue's finances, and overseeing the spiritual welfare of the people. But how much did any of that matter in this moment? Is any of that what Jairus was thinking about? It sure doesn't look like it. And this is true of any one of us, isn't it? It doesn't matter what your standing is. It doesn't matter how much wealth you have, how much power you have, how much influence you might have. When your children are suffering, does anything else matter to you? No. All you can think about is how to make them feel better. So what does Jairus do? He is in a desperate situation. His daughter is ill and getting worse. 
For 12 years, he's loved her and cared for her. He's fed her and clothed her. He's taught her the law of God. And yet, despite his status, despite his money, despite his influence, despite being in the synagogue all the time and talking to so many rabbis, despite all of that, his daughter's still suffering. His daughter is still near death. It doesn't seem like there's anything he can do about it. Well, there was one thing, wasn't there? There was one thing left he hadn't tried, one option that had not been fully explored. He went, and he found who? Jesus. Given the circles he ran in, it shouldn't be surprising to us that he'd heard about Jesus, that he'd heard the things Jesus was teaching and doing, the miracles he was performing. But it was likely that he'd heard a negative side of that. It was likely he'd heard that Jesus was not one to be listened to, that he was not one to be trusted. And yet, just hearing about the word, the word about who Jesus is and what he came to do, through that word, the Holy Spirit worked faith in Jairus. And so Jairus came and sought Jesus' help with his daughter. In his daughter's hour of need, Jairus looked for Jesus. He fell at Jesus' feet, and I want to emphasize how important this is. This is the ruler of the synagogue who makes sure that every single Sabbath, they say the words that what we call the Shema Yisrael. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So what does it tell you when the ruler of the synagogue bows down in submission and reverence for Christ? He cried out to Jesus in verse 23, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Jairus was willing to do anything to save his daughter. So what did Jesus do? Well, it tells us right there. And he went with him. But let's take a moment to think about this scene. They're by the water. A crowd has gathered around Jesus. They want to hear what Jesus has to say. They've all come out for a show. Either a good sermon or a miracle, maybe a little of both. They're pressing in on him. Everybody wants a piece of Jesus. And yet one man comes to Jesus and asks for his help to heal his suffering daughter. And what does Jesus do? He drops what he's doing and goes to help. Have you ever wondered whether Jesus hears your prayers? With so much suffering in the world, with so many needs, have you ever wondered if your prayers kind of get lost in the mix? Have you ever wondered, does he really care about me? There's so many people who are worse off, so many people going through worse things than me. What difference does it make to Jesus? Does he really care about me as an individual? Well, here you have your answer, don't you? He leaves that crowd of people disappointed and confused to go help Jairus and his daughter. Well, no matter. The crowd just says, well, that's okay, we'll go with you. Right? Great, okay, we're going to go with you. The text continues, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. So they wanted to get their show, right? And so they want to go see what he's going to do for Jairus. But then suddenly there's an interruption, a delay. Verse 25. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had but was no better and rather grew worse. Well, that's something a lot of us can relate to, unfortunately, isn't it? She suffered much under many physicians. She spent all she had, and yet she kept getting worse, not better. Like Jairus, she was out of options. 
For 12 years, she'd been suffering this bleed. For the entire length of time that Jairus' daughter was alive, she had been suffering this bleed. For 12 years, she'd been ritually unclean. Think about that. For 12 years, she'd been separated from God, her synagogue, her temple, her community. For 12 years, she'd endured the whispers and rumors about what she might have done to get herself into that situation. We know she had no money, and she likely had few friends left. What could she do? Well, like Jairus, she heard the word about Jesus. She heard the word, and the Holy Spirit worked faith in her through that word. So she went looking for Jesus to help. And unlike Jairus, who boldly pleaded to Jesus, this woman's doing the complete opposite, isn't she? She doesn't even talk to him initially. She comes up with a plan herself. She says, if I go and touch his garment, then I'll be healed. She doesn't even want to be noticed. She's hoping she can do this and then get away so the attention is not brought on her. Jesus isn't having any of that, is he? The contrast between these two individuals is pretty striking. Jairus is a prominent and important man. And the woman, whose name isn't recorded, is ritually unclean and marginalized. And yet both come to Jesus in their desperation. Jairus kneels at Jesus' feet in humility and worship despite his high status. The woman, believing she'll be healed if she just touches Jesus' garment, approaches him with a mixture of fear and faith. When the woman touches his garment and is healed, he seeks her out, not to rebuke her or to criticize her, but to restore her, to uplift her, to call her daughter. It's a term of endearment. He restores her dignity. This is the only instance in the Gospels where Jesus directly addresses someone with that term. It underscores his compassion and personal care for those who suffer. Jairus' faith is shown in his actions. Despite his social standing, he humbles himself before Jesus, believing that Jesus can heal his daughter. His faith is tested further when Jesus is delayed. He's delayed by the crowd, and he's further delayed by this woman's interruption. Think about this from Jairus' perspective for a moment. He's come to Jesus in utter desperation. My daughter is near death. I don't know how much longer she has. And he's left his home without a cell phone or anything to have a status update on what's going on with her. He's trying to find Jesus. He finally does. He gets Jesus' attention. Of all things, Jesus actually agrees to come and help. With all these people here and all these needs, he picks Jairus and says, Jairus, I will come and help you. And at this moment, Jairus doesn't even know if his daughter is still alive or not. Imagine the elation, the joy, when Jairus finally realizes that Jesus is going to come to help. And then what happens? He gets held up. There's this side thing going on. This woman is grabbing at Jesus' cloak when Jesus is on his way to help Jairus' daughter. Imagine Jairus' thought process. We don't know this, right? But imagine his thought process. My situation is urgent. My daughter is near death. This woman has been dealing with this for 12 years. What's another couple of hours, Jesus? This is like the ambulance stopping for Slurpees on the way to the car accident. Come on. You've got somewhere to be. And then his fear is further confirmed when he gets the news. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Your, your daughter is dead. Think about that up and down of emotion Jairus must have been going through. To come in desperation and anxiety. To hear the good news that Jesus is going to come and help. To see Jesus delayed. And then to hear that his daughter 
die. That's a whirlwind of emotion, isn't it? But what comes next? Jesus has some important but challenging words for Jairus in verse 36. Do not fear, only what? Believe. Jesus goes to Jairus' house, and despite the mourners literally laughing at him, he raises the girl from the dead, proving his power over death and his deep compassion for those who trust in him. Jesus shows that this miracle and all his miracles are not limited by our own sense of time or understanding because we're not dealing with a prophet or just a prophet. We're dealing with God. That little bit of time that would have been saved by ignoring the woman maybe seemed like an eternity to Jairus. But how much was that time in the eyes of God? Completely different. And Jesus takes all of our needs whether urgent or chronic by our estimation, and he takes them very seriously. Martin Luther, in his sermon about this text, spoke about these words specifically, the girl is not dead but sleeping. And he focused on this. I want to hear you to hear what Luther said about this. Luther wrote, These words which the Lord here speaks, the maid is not dead but sleeps. We should diligently study. They are words of comfort, for which, if they could be purchased, we should cheerfully give all that we possess in order that we might retain, understand, and believe them as they were intended. Whoever could look upon a dead person as though he were laying upon a bed asleep and so change his vision as to consider death to be asleep would have reason to be proud of a peculiar science not understood by anyone else. Think about that. How quickly we can gloss over those words, but the power of those words for all those mourners who are just weeping and wailing because death is the end and, and there's no coming back from it. And Jesus shows up and says, well, actually there is. There is coming back from this, and I'm going to show you that right here and right now. This is how faith in Christ changes the way we view everything, especially death. That death is not the end, but a beginning a temporary transfer station on our way to eternal glory. Both Jairus' daughter and the bleeding woman experienced Jesus' healing touch. And it's important to note that in both cases, Jesus makes himself ceremonially unclean in order to heal them. I want to emphasize that point for a moment. The Levitical laws that we're talking about here specify what, ha what, what conditions can make someone ceremonially unclean. And two of those conditions were touching a dead body and touching a woman who's bleeding that way. And Jesus could have healed them with just his word. We see that elsewhere in the Gospels, don't we? Hey, Lazarus, get out of that tomb. Okay. Obviously, he can do that. But yet, for these two, there's physical touch. Because Jesus is making himself ceremonially unclean to make them clean. He's taking their uncleanness on himself so that they can stand in the presence of Almighty God. And that is exactly what he has done for you. To take on all your sin and all your uncleanness so that you can stand in the presence of your God and be received by him. This is looking forward to his ultimate sacrifice, isn't it? His death on the cross. He who knew no sin literally became sin for us. Both of these healings give us a glimpse into what that looks like and what that means. Jesus felt the power come out of him when the woman touched his garment. So how did he feel on the cross when it wasn't one woman's bleed but the entire world's sin on his shoulders? What did it feel like when he took on that burden? Luther observed that faith learns the art of laying suffering at the feet of Jesus. That's what faith is for. It teaches us to lay our suffering at the feet of Jesus. 
When we have faith in Christ, we are called to lay our sins on him. The Holy Spirit gives us faith, enabling us to place our sins, our sufferings, and even our deaths at the feet of Christ. And just like with Jairus' daughter and the woman with the bleed, we have a physical connection with Christ as well. It's not just up here, it's also here. In holy baptism and in the Lord's Supper, where Jesus takes on your uncleanness and makes you clean in your body. In baptism, we're united with Christ in his death and resurrection. And in the Lord's Supper, we receive his body and blood, laying our sins on him and receiving new life. St. Paul writes in Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Our suffering, though real and painful, is temporary and pales in comparison to the eternal glory we have in Christ. As Christians, we are called to walk in suffering together, supporting one another in prayer and love, and reminding each other that our suffering is not pointless. As St. Paul writes later in Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Our suffering draws us closer to Christ and closer to one another. Death is the ultimate enemy, but Jesus has conquered death through his resurrection. The world often sees suffering as the enemy and death as a gift, death as the release. But in Christ, suffering has purpose and meaning. Our suffering has meaning because his suffering has meaning. The Holy Spirit grants us faith, and faith puts that into action. We are called to lay all our burdens, including our sin and suffering, at the feet of Christ. I'd like you to change how you think about this. Suffering is not our enemy. Suffering is our teacher. Suffering is not our enemy. Suffering is our teacher. Death is our enemy, a defeated enemy. But suffering is our teacher. It teaches us to rely on Christ. In those moments when the doctors have run out of answers, in those moments when we've run out of money and the credit card's maxed out, in those moments when our children are on the brink of death, in those moments when it looks like our time has run out and we don't have any more options, suffering teaches us to look on Christ, the author of life. And it's not just the big things like death that Jesus sees and helps us with. He cares about all our needs, no matter how small they may seem to us or to other people. He doesn't compare our suffering to that of others, but instead meets us where we are. Both Jairus and the bleeding woman approached Jesus with humility, and he responded with compassion and power. Let's remember that in our suffering. Jesus invites us to come to him in faith. His compassion and power are sufficient to meet all our needs. As we bear one another's burdens, we show Christ's love to a world that is desperately in need of his healing touch. You are his children, and he calls each of you his son or his daughter, and he cares for you accordingly. My friends, Jesus is present in our suffering, offering us healing and restoration. He's with us in our desperation, responding to our faith with compassion and power. And as we lay our burdens at his feet, we experience his love and grace. We're reminded that our suffering is not without purpose, that suffering is our teacher, that it teaches us to rely on Christ. And through faith in him, we find hope and encouragement, knowing that he has conquered death and brought us life. In his name, amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. amen.